Welcome, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk to you about how to start a podcast at your museum in 10 steps. We originally had 12, but we thought that was too many. So we stayed up late condensing it to 10 just for you today, because I know you're tired and no one has time for that extra two steps. I am Hannah Hethman. I am an independent consultant specializing in all things podcasting for museums, history organizations, and cultural nonprofits. I have a podcast called Museums in Strange Places, which is about exploring the world through its museums. Currently on season about Maryland after finishing up a whole season about Iceland. I have a book, there's a free copy for everyone right there, grab it now, grab it later, called Your Museum Needs a Podcast. And I think there's a better way to introduce myself than this. So Ian, would you hit play? I'm your host, a museum consultant specializing in podcasting for museums. And this is a show for people who love museums, stories, culture, and explore the world. Museums are the keepers of our history and culture, but they are also reflections of who we are now. In each season of this podcast, I explore a different country, state, or region through its museums. In season... Well, I won't make you listen to the whole thing. <laughs> museums in Strange Places is an excellent podcast. And I should know because I host one of the biggest and oldest independent museum podcasts called Museum Archipelago. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian Elsner. And my day job is at a, as a software developer and technologist at RLMG, a local exhibit design and media company here in Boston. I started Museum Archipelago because museums have unchecked structural power. And uh, the Wall Street Journal reviews of various museums aren't really cutting it. So Museum Archipelago, now in its 61st episode, uh, takes my audience on a, um, a journey to different museums all around the world and talking to some of the people whose voices we don't normally hear. And I'm going to play you my intro. Welcome to Museum Archipelago. I'm Ian Elsner. Museum Archipelago guides you through the rocky landscape of museums. Each episode is never longer than 15 minutes. Very catchy. It's so a good podcast. I was interviewed on episode 31, 33 maybe. So one of the better episodes. So check that out. <laughs> Those are the early, early days. Um, so, so go ahead. <laughs> why, so why podcasting? I'll take, I'll take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so podcasting, Hannah and I are so excited about podcasting because in many ways it's the antidote to sort of the toxicity of social media. Podcasting is a throwback to an earlier web, a direct web that allows for um, an institution like a museum or an individual like the two of us to have a direct connection to an audience and a really intimate relationship with the audience without algorithms getting in the way. And it's where the people are. It's growing like crazy. Yeah, so actually, at this year, as of March, half of all Americans have listened to a podcast. It is no longer a niche thing. Um, back in the days when Mark Maron had his TV show and the, the like, main plot point is him explaining to everyone what a podcast is, are over. Uh, and 90 million Americans listen to podcasts on a regular basis. So that's a huge portion of uh, American audience. Anyone out from outside the US? Uh, UK? Mainly UK, also really big, not as much. Um, but if you want stats, feel free to email me and I will find them for you on your country. Um, it's growing all over the world. Um, and it's no surprise that it's growing. It's, Be it's good stuff. It's good stuff because for audiences, it's accessible, intimate, and engaging. And for museums, there's no gatekeeper who says whether or not you can make one. You don't have to have a network's permission. Um, it builds audiences. It builds really devoted audience. And it extends the museum beyond the physical space into any home, car, workplace, airplane where people have a device that has at one point been connected to the internet. Point number one in our step, create a good show concept. So let's say you wanted to start a podcast about Star Wars. Well, we think that's actually a bad idea. A lot of museums in, our, in the workshop that we did earlier 
we're talking about having sort of a podcast for this general audience. That let's let's figure out as many people as as we can and bring them into our tent. That milk toast approach isn't going to cut it in the world of podcasting, because there's already podcasts about Star Wars that are better than yours. You're you're never going to make a Star Wars about podcast that's more popular than the ones that already exist. Now, what you can do as a museum is look to a slice of the Star Wars universe that you can be really passionate about. We suggest Ewoks. Ewoks、uh, from the Forest Moon of Endor are a Star Wars character that doesn't. The, 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 there are podcasts about Ewoks, but、uh, you know they aren't really good. Underserved. So, uh, 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 so you, as a museum, as a, as a museum looking to start your podcast, we want you to go specific. And the great thing about, say, something like Ewoks is that it has a built-in audience. There are thousands of people all around the world who enjoy cosplaying as Ewoks, dressing up as Ewoks for conventions. Those are your audiences, and we think that it applies just as well in the Star Wars fan community as it does for museums. Speaking of which, I have a real-life museum example. So the Texas Bullock State History Museum. I think I said all those words in the right order. In Austin.、Um, Had decided to create a podcast. Now they interpret the history of Texas, and as we all know, Texas is big, so there's a lot of history. So that's really broad, and there's a lot of podcasts that interpret the history of Texas, and there's a lot of、um, anything on the history of Texas. It's big, so maybe they could have gone down to Texas music history. They do a lot of music there. It's Austin, right? Still really big. Um, and it's going to be hard to compete with all the other great stuff out there, professional shows and so on. Well, they're having an exhibit about Stevie Ray Vaughan. They could focus in and use what they know now about Stevie Ray to create a podcast about、uh, Austin's favorite son or Texas's favorite son. But still, there's a lot of information online and all in the world about Stevie Ray Vaughan, and Stevie Ray Vaughan fans. Are hardcore. So how are you going to get them something better than they already have? Well, what they did is they went even deeper. And had a staff member who knew nothing about Stevie Ray Vaughan, Evan Windham, go on a personal journey of discovery,、um, learning about Stevie Ray Vaughan, understanding his music and why he mattered by interviewing his friends, family, people he played with, and accessing these materials and resources that only the museum could get her into. So, if you were a Stevie Ray fan, incredible content that you hadn't heard before. And if you had no idea, like me, who Stevie Ray Vaughan was, it's okay. We. The rest of you can admit it too.、Um, you learned from with someone else, and you didn't feel excluded.、Um, but it was a really unique perspective, and no one else has done this. Step number two: get some equipment. This is、uh, there are many many ways to get into podcasting, and Hannah and I have two different two different approaches. I use iOS. I have microphones that plug directly into my phone and iPad. And so I use the Shure MV88. That's this little guy right here. I keep it in my bag at all times in case I end up at an interesting museum, which is something that happens to us. We end up at an interesting museum, and we want to talk to somebody there. And、uh, so this little microphone has come in handy a lot of times for sort of bigger,、um, more planned museum situations. I use the Shure MV5, and you can see the prices listed on there. It is. Not that much. Yeah, and、um, I have a slightly different setup,、uh, but I like the Zoom H4n Pro handy recorder. It's pretty durable, goes everywhere. I don't need to have internet connection, or、um, I previously had a phone with no storage. The iOS did not work for me. And then I connect it to an ATR2100 for sit-down interviews or for、um, scripting. This has is a cheap mic, but it has a really nice deep sound. It's kind of like this one, that style of microphone. And then for my more mobile experiences, as I've progressed my podcast, I like to walk and talk a lot.、Um, I like to be mobile. I like to move. I use、um, an equivalent of the Rode recorder,、um, which you just hold in your hand and you can walk around. So if I was going to go talk to each of you,、um, I would do that.、Um, if you're trying to write notes, please do. But it's also listed in the book,、uh, so you'll be able to reference that later. So once you have your equipment, you need to record something, right?、Um, so. You need to get some tape, as we call it in the industry,、um, which is throwback to before I was podcasting when it was real tape.、Um, so when you're interviewing someone, you don't want to just ask them 
questions that have dry answers. Where are you from? When were you born? Then you just have this back and forth grilling. Instead, you want to ask questions that and prompt them to tell you a story. You don't need to be there if they tell a story. You can just ask a question and let them go. Tap into their natural passion. So I like these big, prompting, leading questions. will get even the most quiet, reticent person um, excited. So tell me about Ewoks. Why do Ewoks matter? What should people know about Ewoks? Tell me the story of how Ewoks came to be. What's a common misconception about Ewoks? Tell me what we're looking at here. What is this furry creature in front of me? What's the takeaway? What's, what's the big idea here? And one that I really love, if the interview's not going well, I used this the other day, if they're not quite getting there, what would be lost if Ewoks were to go extinct? Well, I think the uh, Galactic Empire might see to that. Yeah, but um, so, step four. Edit, 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 edit. So we've divided our slides into nicely timed chunks, but this is where you're gonna spend most of your time, unless you outsource it to a professional. Um, so editing a podcast and audio is kind of like sculpting. It is an art form, so you start with the big raw block of the text or the, the audio and you chip down bit by bit until you have just the right shape and then maybe you polish it up into a beautiful Michelangelo statue of David or perhaps you leave it a little more rough but evocative. As long as it's doing the trick and invoking feeling in someone, it doesn't have to be so perfect as the David. We wanted uh, to give you an example of what our editing setups look like. I also edit completely on iOS, so that means I record and edit on the same device, which is really helpful, traveling to various places around the world. And I use this little Apple Pencil here to make the fine precision cuts on an iOS app called Ferrite. And I like to edit with Audacity. It's a free open source software that you can download. It kind of works like GarageBand or any other music editing software. It's got a lot of functions. As you can see here, I can add a lot of different tracks. This is working with three different interviews, a script and music, and it's pretty easy to organize and move around. Nothing too fancy for me. Uh, because it's open source, there's also infinite YouTube tutorials on how to use it, and it has its entire own wiki manual, which comes in really handy. I just found something out at a last workshop last week that I had no idea it did because someone asked, we looked to the manual, there was the answer. We wanted to give you an example of how important editing is and how editing can really bring out, can really turn an interview that is uh, good, it has a lot of interesting things to say, but isn't very concise into something that actually your audience will want to listen to and can actually make a point in the world. I'm going to sh uh, share with you the raw audio that I recorded last week in Devonport, Tasmania, Australia. Why was I in Devonport, Tasmania, Australia? Um, listen to my podcast. It's a pretty good, it's a pretty good podcast. Uh, this is an interview with David Goh at the Tigera Aboriginal Cultural Center and Keeping Place. And this is his response to a question about the similarities between uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal people and First Peoples of Canada and Native Americans in the United States. And this was his answer. I'm just going to play a little bit of it. And this, is, uh, this is really important for our community as well. And um, we've got a lot of kids that are growing up in schools that um, have gone through similar things as in Navajo and other nations of, um, you know, with um, identity, um, lack of passing down of knowledge. That's like this. Yeah, so there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of good stuff there, but it's, it's not quite there. And this is what uh, a possible editing, edited version of that will be. You can see that he had a lot of hesitation in his voice when he was talking. Again, we can all see what he's trying to say, but after some rearranging and some editing and some turning those ellipses where he kind of trailed off into periods, again, all happening in the editing process, this is what it turned out to be. The impacts of colonization and displacement is made families went through great trauma and that, that still affects us. We've got a lot of kids that are growing up in schools that have gone through similar things as the Navajo and, and other nations. Some kids go up that original or does that mean they don't really grow up knowing a lot about what their ancestors did or what happened to, to their families. So again, nice and concise, it's exactly what he's saying 
but we all need a little help. Yeah, it's an editing process, just like a book. Um, so much better, I'd much rather listen to that personally. So again, it's an art form. And the, Ian didn't just go in, pick what he wanted. He had to cut down, cut down, think about it, step back, look at it, and come back to the sculpture, carve off a little here, being really careful not to accidentally chop off where he thought the nose was gonna be. <laughs> so, step number five, write and record a script. Ian, why is scripting such a valuable tool for podcasting? I'm glad you asked. It helps us drive the narrative forward when the interview, or the presentation, is a bit dull in places. Do you think it could help us connect two topics that aren't really connected? Related? Only, only if it's done well. Let's try it. Step five, six, build a compelling brand. Um, so your cover art is really important. Your branding is really important. Once you get people listening to your podcast, they will be engaged, but you have to get them to take that step. And it's a bigger step to listen to a podcast than to let a Facebook video play or read the first two lines of a blog as I usually do. So with this cover art, you know exactly what this podcast is about. You know who it's by and you know the tone. Like there is nothing else you need to know to make a decision about whether or not you're going to like this show. And I mean, you may not always be able to be that effective, but that's the idea. And it also has to look good as a thumbnail, not a slide up on the wall, so real little. Um, in your description, in the way you're writing about your show, in the way you're um, speaking about your show, the reaction should be, now that's something I have to hear, right? That's not something I've heard before. That's not something, not something I could hear anywhere else. Really sell people, let them know why they should listen, what they're gonna get, and why this is important, add a why statement. Ian always likes to say, what's your, your why statement? <laughs> oh, um, in, uh, your, in your podcast, you say, museums are not neutral, no right. museum is an island. And no. I say, I think you heard mine. Museums are reflections of who we are now. So once you agree with that statement, you're on board, I got gotcha. you. And this, is, this branding is particularly important because the audience is listening to the podcast on their own terms. Again, this is why it is different from the social media platforms we're used to. They're, they could be listening through the transcript, uh, which is something important to have on your, on your uh, homepage. They could be listening through the show notes. They're listening on any device. They've got the audio however they've, however they've got it. It's just an RSS protocol. And so having that brand be able to express itself through everyone's various ways that they access this audio is super crucial. Yep, exactly. Seven. Seven, host it online and connect the pipes. It's just an RSS feed, but it still needs to be hosted somewhere. We have uh, two different services that, that we like. Mm -hmm. And again, this is like from experience. Hannah likes Libsyn. I like Fireside. Both are perfectly adequate. Once you have a place that all of these are hosting, hosted, you need to connect the, the pipes to the various podcast directories that there are. Uh, many of you have heard of Apple Podcasts, that's probably the largest directory, but there are hundreds of others and there's huge competition in this space to try and outdo Apple in their, their sort of big data about the podcasts. Again, the important thing to keep in mind here is that you still own the content. You own the servers that the files are hosted at. It's yours, it's your museums. It's not, it's not a situation like YouTube where you're putting your file on somebody else's platform. You still get to own your content. Yep, and so once you have it on a hosting platform, they'll give you some instructions, boop, boop, boop. Now it's on Spotify, now it's on Google Podcasts, now it's on Stitcher, now it's on Radio Lab, now it's on Overcast, now it's on Castro, now it's on everywhere else that people might be listening. So make sure you Google all the places that people are listening and make sure that you're not missing out on anyone. Let us know if you have any questions. Yeah. Eight, launch your amazing show. So do not walk into the room and be like, yeah, I made a show, it's fine. Be this guy, okay? Like, make an entrance, make a statement. You need to treat your launch like a movie premiere. You have put a lot of time into this and maybe a lot of money. It's kind of an in inverse relationship, um, either or, um, sometimes both. Um, so make sure everyone's on board. Make sure every staff member is excited. Because if you can launch with a buzz, you will kind of jumpstart the more slow and steady growth process that podcasts typically see. So I really recommend this strategy, build a launch team. This is good for anything. I did it with my book. It was very successful. So get 150 to 250 people, your dedicated volunteers, people who worked on the podcast, people interviewed in the podcast, your excited donors, your board members, whoever is most excited about your show or the subject material, put them into an email list, 
and send them tasks. Guys, the trailer is coming out. By the way, a trailer is a great idea. Do that. Um, a trailer is coming out in three days. When the trailer comes out, here's what you're going to do. You're going to listen. You're going to review it on iTunes. And then you're going to share it with all your friends. And then on the day it comes out, here's a tweet that we send out that you can retweet. Here's an Instagram post that we send out that you can reshare. Here's a Facebook post that we can reshare. And that will get this thunderclap of marketing at the same time where everyone's sharing with their friends. and. Uh, Apple Podcasts and other players will recognize that. And this is a strategy that the Tenement Museum used for How to Be an American, which just launched. Great podcast, great example of museums podcasting. And they used this strategy, and now they made it to the top front homepage of Apple Podcasts. Can you imagine your museum getting on the homepage of Apple Podcasts or like, you know, the number one show on YouTube or something like this? So even yesterday, I was still scrolling through for new podcasts in society and culture, and boom, there they were, the Tenement Museum. I could have easily stumbled across them, even if I didn't know what they were. I saw their really great little logo, How to Be American, enticing, jumped on it. So do that um, and make it an event, make it physical, host a listening party. Have chips, have coloring pages, have slideshows, you know, whatever is appropriate to the tone of your podcast. Get people in a room and get them listening. Have a red carpet for whoever's featured on the podcast. Do anything you need to do to get journalists in, get press. Make it a big event. Make sure people know that this isn't just something released online. Like, you made a podcast, okay? This is really exciting and everyone should be excited to listen. Step number nine, find your audience and stick with them. So this is after you've launched, you've had your big launch party with coloring books, etc. Build community around your podcast. This is one of the things, because everyone is coming to it on their own terms, it's up to you to sort of make sure that everyone is together in that virtual room and talking about what you're talking about, being engaging, not just in terms of liking on Facebook. It's a much deeper form of engagement. It's this, they're listening to your voice every two weeks, say, yeah. of every two weeks, you have, or however often your podcast comes out, you can start to see that super fans are much more, are, they're, they're both more valuable and they're also much more likely to happen with a podcast than casual listeners. The, you, you can really force that, or not force, you can, you can really forge that connection, thank you. You can really forge that connection with people because they're listening to your voice and all of its imperfections. And, you know, I should say, it may seem like Ian and I are besties, but we met four days ago um, after listening to each other's voices for a year and a half. Um, and so I kind of forgot at some point, we were out to like dinner and I was like, oh, I have no idea like where you grew up or anything about you. But it um, felt like we knew each other like we knew each because other. we've been listening yeah. to each other's podcasts. I at least know where he's been going to museums. So, um, I also like to use the metaphor of a garden. So, there's nothing wrong with having an event where you plant a bunch of annuals in the garden and invite everyone in for a party, right? It'll be beautiful for one season. Um, annuals being planted only last one season for my non-gardening people. Um, and everyone will come in, they'll see the flowers, they'll enjoy them, and then the garden will die and people will move on to another event. That's fine, but know what you're getting into. You might put more money into the garden for a little shorter return. Or you could build a bigger garden, do a little more intensive landscaping, grow it over time until you have the palm house at Kew Gardens, right? It's a slow and steady growth over time. And in that way, over the course of three or four years, you'll have a lot more people coming back regularly to enjoy your garden for various reasons. Step number 10, evaluate and grow. This is one of the reasons why we say that it's okay to be niche, it's okay to be esoteric is because with 150 downloads, you are in the top 50% of all podcasts. As Hannah likes to say, can you imagine if you had 150 people in the room every week or every other week listening to what you had to say? It's kind of like the feeling that we have right now. Yeah, 150 people, that's right. Wow. Um, but you know, the interesting statistic is that 80% of regular podcast listeners in the US say that they listen to most or all of every episode they start. And you can actually measure this on Apple Podcasts. People listen to about 75 to 85% of the, my episodes. Um, and so this means that if you have 40 minutes, they're listening to the whole thing. So once that brand gets them in the door, they're there and they're hooked. So you're measuring very differently than you would a YouTube video or a Facebook video where someone's coming on, looking a little popping off, right? There's really deep, meaningful engagement. And I like, kind of like to think it's two-way. 
uh, you're speaking to them and they're actively listening back, imagining what you look like, imagining the things you're talking about. There's a participatory element there. Um, if you do a really good marketing job like the Attendant Museum does, you could be in the top 10% of all podcasts. Um, this is hosted on Libsyn, but it's pretty representative of the field. So that's what they did. Um, so 150 is good, but if you do the marketing part, you'd be top 10% of all podcasts, and that is a great number to take back to your director at the end of the project. And you can start looping that data that you get back into, back into your podcast, figure out what people, what people like, which episodes are more popular, and you can sort of use that to continue the growth of your podcast. Mm -hmm. And so that was step 10, that's it. Simple, easy, no big deal, right? Um, maybe not, but I wanted to stress that low tech does not equal low quality. We're big fans of quality. It's right in your ears. It does need to sound good at some level, right? Um, so I want to give an example. I just wrapped up production on a mini series for the National Archives in the UK. And I set them up with about $500 of equipment, pretty much what I showed you on my slide, plus a few accessories. Because um, they had a kind of moderate budget. And then they wanted their staff to be involved and they wanted it to be their own voice. So I did a two or three hour training with their staff on how to use a microphone. We planned a story, we planned a concept, and I helped them develop a list of who to interview and what to ask. And then I sent them into the bowels of the archives, a big brutalist building in London. So it is bowels of the archive. Um, and then they sent me back about 20 recordings and with a little editing magic and art, I turn that into three stories. And so here is the trailer for this podcast made by, recorded by staff, and even the narrator was a staff member who I coached through reading a script, um, who had no previous training using under $500 worth of equipment, plus a little editing magic from me. Please now burn this and my previous letter. Well, it's probably the most famous spy story, spy network that people have heard of. We've managed to piece together the story because we have a voluntary statement that was made by the head of the Paris Gestapo, Hans Kiefer. He talks about her great courage she refers to and the fact that they didn't manage to get any information out of her when she was being held in captivity in Paris. Gertrude Bell is widely um, viewed as the female Lawrence of Arabia, but I always held the view that maybe Lawrence should be seen as the male Gertrude Bell. They managed to, in a sense, insert themselves into the most important and sensitive elements of the British states, and at the same time, we were managing to send information to, to Moscow. It was such a, a well-planned organisation that Stalin himself thought the whole thing was too remarkable and that it was a British plot to provide disinformation. I think the popular perception of Lawrence today is Peter O'Toole, you know, piercing blue eyes and white billowing robes, but that's also a myth rather than historical reality. You're listening to On The Record, a podcast by the National Archives that takes a closer look at the stories you think you know. Here at the National Archives, we are the guardians of more than 11 million historical government and public records spanning a thousand years of British history. These original documents have some incredible stories to tell about spies in our midst, if you know where to look. In this three-part series, you and I, with the help of historians and record experts at the National Archives, are going to use personnel files secret government reports and declassified correspondence to uncover the true stories of famous spies from King Alfred the Great to the Cambridge Five. So, low budget, relatively speaking. Uh, it's doable, it's possible, and that's kind of why I love podcasting. It's a storytelling medium that happens to use a little technology. If you do video, you have to do all of this uh, plus the image. Yeah. So I don't even know how you do it. So we kind of want to leave you with this exhortation. So above all, the best advice you could have from us is tell stories. Don't give people facts. Don't just try to educate people. That's a great like you know sub goal, right? But tell stories, and then people will come along with you. 
to hear the rest. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the methods today, but the best thing you can do is get out of the way and let, let the story uh, let the story come out as much as possible. Come blog, right? Yeah, or Marvel. <laughs> um, so that's us. Thanks for listening. We're, we're done a little early. So we have a lot of time for questions. And I figure we can do questions on whatever we didn't cover. And then if we have extra time, we could also let you go early. Or um, we could do a little concept brainstorming. So if anyone wants to volunteer their concept idea, we can help you refine it. And I will say, for those that may leave early, there's free books. My book, free copy of my book there for you at Ian Swag, so make sure you grab one of those before you go. So that's it. Questions? Would you run? I, I, yeah. I'll, let me do it. And then you can speak in that mic. I'll speak in this mic. Hello. Um, what's your favorite source for background music? Ooh, I got to use this one from Soundstrike right now. I'm only into it. $15 a month for a lot of limited licensing. So you just, uh, it's like good music. Like I make playlists to listen to while I'm working. It's really good stuff. So Soundstrike is good. There's also free music archive where people just put music on there in the public domain. Um, but just make sure it's not copyrighted. I also like the links. In response to that question, SoundCloud also has a filter for like uh, Creative Commons. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anything in the public domain. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, how much do you pay for hosting on Libsyn and Fireside? Libsyn, I do fifteen to twenty dollars a month to get the extended stats, but it starts at five or ten dollars a month. Do you think it's worthwhile trying to host it on your own servers, or is it worth like? Because it seems so like there's a lot of additional... Yeah, so you can, like, if you have the expertise, that's fine. But also what Libsyn's great is um, Libsyn has you fill in the metadata for the various platforms. So Radio Public wants this thing. So it will prompt you to put that all in there so that your show is properly formatted for all the different other platforms. So it's much easier. Yeah, and going off of that, as the podcast landscape evolves, uh, sites like Libsyn and Fireside will keep you up to date. They'll prompt you to say, oh, Stitcher is becoming big. Uh, here's how you add your, your site to Stitcher. Yeah, I'd also like, say, add those numbers to the title and we'll put them in this box instead. Exactly. And, and, and so, so that's a way to keep, keep up to date is using a service like that. Cool. Other questions? We'll have to work our way back. <laughs> um, my question would be just thinking about management at my museum, and this is something we're very, very, very just beginning to talk about. Um, audience demographic is so important to them through social media, and I just don't know, but I just don't know, how, how can you determine that? Does that come from the, the platform? Do you want to take yeah, this? so what we do know is that uh, podcast listeners, the, there's a lot of stats out there on podcast listeners generally, so you can go to Edison Research. Um, has done a lot of stuff. Um, if you email me, I will send you the direct links. Um, but there's, there's just people just, just starting to do a lot of research. Edison is a big one doing this research. So we know that podcast is growing among all segments. It's particularly growing among 12 to 24 year olds, but all ages listen. But it's really emerging among the people who are at risk for leaving Facebook. Um, and uh, podcast listeners generally tend to be like the biggest cohort is like 18 to 35. They tend to be educated. Creative, entrepreneurial, and brand loyal. So 1% of podcast listeners would typically take action on a uh, advertising call to action, which is an interesting stat when you think about what if the call was like, visit our website or get involved in the museum in some way, maybe not you know, in person, but one out of hundred people hopefully would, would take that physical step. Maybe more, if you want to um, So I think that's what we know about podcast listeners generally, but you can find more data on how they listen and that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah. And the analytics are getting better. His, just based on the protocol, all we know is who, or all we know is that somebody downloaded something yeah. and what their IP address was. Yes, yeah, so where, basically. And, 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 yeah, exactly. And using the IP address, you can have a good shot at determining which city. Okay. But many podcast platforms are becoming, uh, they're, they're, they're now adding a lot of that. The demand will increase in the next few years. As big money gets into this, yeah. Yeah. who else had a question? Good question. It, it's one of those things evaluation is still a little tricky, but that's why I really like having a listening party afterwards because then you can literally see what people. I mean, I just play with my mom and watch and see what she thinks, but 
Um, you can play it for your people and see the audience and get that feedback about how people are feeling and experiencing it. And that's going to be a good, hopefully, predictor of, of how it goes. And getting people to review it on Apple will get you that physical feedback as well. So if you go to the Tenet Museum, they have 55 reviews or something like that um, because of their launch strategy. But it also that provides a tangible feedback with words describing what they like. So this is sort of a concept question. Um, we have, we actually had a radio show that has sort of become a podcast cast. Um, that's basically, it started out as sort of boring um, what's happening at the museum, and now it's become get to know the people who work at the museum, mm -hmm. and it's been really popular. It's a small enough city that everybody can What museum? Uh, the Doing Arts Center. Okay. Um, and it, it still does actually air on public radio, but we have it available on our website to download. We're, we're treating it like a podcast for all intents and yeah, um, we have a 75 year anniversary coming up, and I want to do an art, it's now run for marketing, I'm a curator. I actually want to do like a people from history of the museum as we're rolling up to this anniversary um, to talk about, you know, who, who built this museum, sort of really, we have a lot of success with sort of the local mm -hmm. stories around our institution, and we have a lot of buy-in from being there's children. Do you think that, do we just do, more episodes of Radio Art Center that have to do with this, or do I maybe think about creating like a limited series or a, a separate sub podcast that's just related to these 75th anniversary stories? Well, if the stories are compelling enough for each one to get their own episode and they're powerful stories. Um, if they fit into the mold, right, you're talking about people from the museum, maybe it's like a special four part within there. The next four episodes will cover not just anyone in the museum, but the people in the history of the museum. It sounds like that fits into the concept really well um, because I wonder if you have like the long term on that being able to do a whole limited run series um, with just that idea might be a lot of work for when you already have an existing audience built in and you have a public radio partnership. So normally I'd be like a little more picky, but if public radio is going to broadcast it, you know, definitely try and see if it fits within that mold and frame it so that it's a special version of whatever you're already doing. And we're on one a month now with public radio, but we have the option to do more like big elements. Um, <laughs> that's great. The public radio partnerships are a great idea if you can. Uh, the, uh, in, in Oklahoma, the Philbrook partnered with their local Tulsa Public Radio to do Museum Confidential, which is the behind the scenes, and the MoMA partnered with WNYC for a really successful uh, limited run with uh, the Broad City Ladies, and it was really great, so a good idea. Another question? Hi, Jim. Hi, thanks for a hugely instructive session. Um, I loved the immediate multi-locality of a podcast. Is there a genuine user consideration about any of your interviewees who might have very strong accents or are just really boring to listen to their voice? Like, they might have the most amazing story to tell, yeah. but, you know, you just switch off. I have an anecdote about that, unless you want to answer it, Ian. I also have an anecdote. Okay. Go first. <laughs> so I was up in Akre, Islam, in Iceland, interviewing a woman at a really boring museum. Um, the history museum just like, had like, stuff, like garbage from their history of interviewing. And I was like, Authenticity is important and people can, people can smell bullshit a mile away, particularly the people in the demographics that we're talking about. But the other, the other thing that, that, that I've done is I've actually had people on Museum Archipelago, several actually, who said, I would love to be interviewed, but because of what I'm talking about, because I'm trash talking my institution, because uh, I fear for my job, 
I do not, I, I cannot allow my voice to go on. And in those cases, I've hired a voice actor to uh, take what I have transcribed from their speech and played it out. And so it's, it's the same process, it's just an extra step. Taking that editing that we just showed you, then once I have that, um, asking a voice actor to, to do it and then editing it in. Mm. And of course, then there's a little bit of, um, then there's a little bit of copy saying exactly what happened on those. So that's, a, that's one of the ways, if you are being a little subversive, that you can, that you can still get around that. And if, for example, you're working with uh, an existing recording audio that's like really bad quality, like it's archival, and you want to have that element of like their voice, but it's hard to listen. You will have heard NPR and stuff doing that. They start to play, but they start to play the person talking in their original language, and then they quickly fade it down and then start the translation above it, or start the transcription above it. Um, so you can fade the original article. So what he's saying is, and kind of hearing it play in the background, you've gotten a sense of what it sounds like, but you don't have to like do the work. So those are kind of three approaches for three different problematic audio things. Any other questions? Does anyone have a, a uh, podcast or a, an idea that they'd like to workshop in the time that we have left? Yeah, we have, we have 10 minutes to workshop yet. Mike goes to you, hold on. I'm running as fast as I can. <laughs> Come on up. So yeah, just real quick, tell us what you're doing and we'll see if we can workshop. Um, so it's kind of an unformed concept, but we, with our video content, for example, um, I work with Body Camping Arts, and we have a lot of interest in artistic process, and I'm kind of really good with what you um, But the thing that you said about podcasting and visual medium, I thought that was really interesting, um, and I hadn't really probably grasped that, and what I'm just kind of thinking about, what we're thinking about, very loose idea, is how can we make a podcast for artists, for makers, which is giving you insight into um, Process, perhaps a sense of advice or how to, like only how to do a how to video. How do you do a how to podcast for making art? Okay, so like a creative. It, right, did you have someone in my workshop as well? Yes. Okay, I thought that, like, <laughs> someone has the same idea. So, <laughs> um, so, kind of what I said there is find a way so that you can comply with what, what is unique about what perspective you have as an institution. So, there are a lot of creative process podcasts out there, and actually what I would go do is listen to a lot of self-help and entrepreneurial podcasts, um, because those are a huge genre of people like to listen to podcasts that make them better people and teach them how to do stuff, and like, I mean, people really are horrible just like listen to business podcasts all day, every day, right? Or listen to gardening podcasts all day, every day, or whatever crafting podcasts. So find the podcasts that are already doing what you're doing, and the podcasts that are in a similar genre, listen to them, and as Ian said, Find out what annoys you about those podcasts, and then and, uh, what's, and what's missing about those podcasts, yeah. and and uh, take a look at that. To what's start. the Ewok cosplayer angle, right? Who, who's the underserved there? What voices aren't you maybe uh, putting up? Maybe this is a podcast about creative process from um, people who don't normally hear about their creative process. Maybe it's you know amateur artists or whatever. Um, or, you know, kind of figure out what's the thing that your institution can give access to or allow that is totally unique and you can't get anywhere else. So really defining that idea of podcast about the creative process, or, and, and I'm saying that to like say, find a thing, like it's the creative process, not generally it's podcast about artists talking about things they like. Um, find something that kind of niche boil down, um, it doesn't have to be the same every time, um, and then, yeah, find exactly what you're doing, and then frame it in a way that people go, I haven't heard that perspective before, right? Um, so that they know that even if they listen to every other creative process, art, whatever podcast out there, this is going to offer them something new and something unique that's going to inspire them. So I hope that's helpful. Yours is really an issue of framing. And, and, I, and I think we both agree that it's a, it's a really great idea. I think there's a lot there. And I would also recommend paying attention to how it's received, paying, paying attention to you know, you might have people listening who aren't artists themselves but want a certain perspective or want to apply that to their business life or their gardening life or whatever yeah, the case is. Yeah, What can you learn from artists about life? You don't yeah. have to do that one, but... Yeah, exactly. exactly. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot there. I think it's an interesting idea and you should run with it. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to volunteer their idea to be gently critiqued and informed? No? You can tell us how gently you want it to be critiqued in the beginning of your well, question. We, we were nice and gentle on that one. This is like podcast script. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Ian, okay. so, I have like very small ideas. Yeah. Big ideas. Something like oral history driven. What's the museum first? Uh, it's the special collections, the library. 
for special okay. collections at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we want to like reach out to the community and involved? There's an idea about music, the music scene in Corpus Christi, no, and something about world histories, um, like talking to a lot of people and like threading, threading, making a story out of it. So I don't know if there's enough in that like. Do you already have world histories? No. Okay. It would be about going out and finding mm -hmm. and doing the interviews. Um, so, so you have a lot of music stuff in your collection. No, we don't. We have, we have a staff member who's interested. <laughs> okay, so what's the connection to the collection? Or the connection to the institution? Um, it's, well, community-driven collections. We okay. Want, we want more community collections. Okay. So, so I mean... So it might be like new collections. I mean, I, I don't know exactly where we're, quite where we're going yeah, with this. It's good. It's, it's good. But um, one thing it, this brings, brings up is that your podcast doesn't have to be about you. It's not all about you. Um, your podcast is about your community. So a podcast, a little tiny podcast that I love is called Marietta Stories. And it's this guy in Marietta, Georgia, who goes and he's a videographer or whatever, but he just interviews different people in his community from the main actor to the store owner to whoever, and just ask them about their lives and their stories and, and their place in Marietta. And it's this incredible community building podcast. And so he finds himself and he's connecting people to each other. So if your goal is to say, this is a place where the community is, is saved and housed, um, maybe it's a podcast about people in Corpus Christi. And maybe it's framed in such a way that you know, you've got to have a little more of a hook, because Marietta is small enough, there's no other Marietta podcasts, right? I guess in Corpus Christi, maybe someone else got some podcasts. See what else is being done. Maybe it's a podcast where you ask someone to let you come in their home and show you how they say, like where what their history is saved, you know, something like that. Maybe not so stock, but kind of, um, yeah, how they see their family histories, their lives, um, and maybe maybe there's just maybe it's just about them, and there's a hook at the end. What what do you want to contribute to the collection? And they give you something to put in the collection, and you describe it, and then you take it home with you, right? And so you might have that kind of NPR style where you're going, I like it when you in someone's home, like find, meeting them in the community where they're at. I know the board is great for that, um, that kind of thing. Um, and so that it does the work of that community, but at the end there's that like, and we're doing this because we want to collect people's lives. We want to represent this person in our collection. So now Jane is in the collection. I don't remember three point two whatever, and you can come see it and reference it if you if you want to learn about her in twenty years. So to make something like that would work well. Yeah, and another another thing is that you don't have to release it right away. A lot of people come up to us and ask us, oh, I want to start a podcast, how should I go about it? This is not in the museum world. We we like to say, make three episodes that are ready for that are ready for the world, but don't release them yet. Listen to them after a week, listen to them after a month, and make sure it holds your attention. Because if it doesn't hold your attention or those who love you the most, then it's yeah, not going to. Those love you the most, if you've been working on it for a while. Yeah, <laughs> and, you, and then it's not going to hold the world's attention. So you are participating in the attention economy, but that doesn't mean you have to release it right away. So whatever, whatever sort of local angle you decide, make a couple of episodes, see how it works before even thinking about buying hosting uh, from one of the sites we recommend. Yeah. And on kind of a similar note, maybe you go and interview 15 people and you use the best five. And you let them know this record will go in our oral collections, no matter what, um, but we'll put some of them out for the podcast. And that gives you the ability to avoid the people who don't talk well or whose stories aren't interesting. Um, and maybe just the first five of you that are very good. Um, and, and, but also you're out there for I mean, your collections anyway. You can use that. That audio is still really useful and you can save it in your collection. Lots of stuff to work with there, but don't be afraid to make it not about you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, this is really helpful. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. I think that's I think that's a wrap on time. Again, if you came late, there's three books for everyone. Grab one. If you want to grab an extra, feel free. I will take them home, but I don't have to. Um, and then Ian has some swag over there. And if you have questions, tweet or email us. Or, or come we'll, talk to us now. Yeah, come talk to us now. We're right here and eager to talk. Because that's what we do on podcasts as we talk. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.